So welcome everybody. Now it's time to start our next session, challenges in an energy system. Quite high topic area right now. And uh, before we start, I like to mention once again that you can ask questions to the speakers by going into menti.com and use this code 61586353. And that's both for you here in the room and the one who's following us online. So I like to introduce our first speaker who is um, at the grid company Vattenfall El Distribution. And she is also a former student at Mid Sweden University and studied a power system engineering program. So welcome Yvonne Revaida. Thank you very much and very fun to be here. And uh, I just want to warn you, this is about the challenges in the energy system, but not about the price challenge. Uh, if you have questions about that, ask them later. I'm going to talk more about the technical challenges uh, that we are working with uh, every year and that are changing even when the energy system is changing. So what are the trends uh, that affect electrification and that also changes our challenges? So for example, we have production uh, that is disappearing. Uh, we have uh, new, uh, very huge actors like data centers, battery industries, um, and of course EV chargers, the big ones that are coming. The cities are, are um, um, growing a lot. And we also have renewables coming into the energy system. And then we actually have a very old grid. The grid uh, on the transmission side is actually due to be repaired now everywhere or to be renewed because it's actually uh, it's so old. So all this together gives the background of the challenges. And then we have, of course, the climate issue and where the energy system with the Swedish fossil free electricity uh, is challenged because all the, the existing um, traffic sector and the industry sector, they want to use electricity so that we will become fossil free. So, uh, I'm with a grid company and uh, grid companies, we are, we are dimensioning our grid and it's power that is the dimensioning. So energy production and for example, the power balance nationally and also the frequency, they are not issues that are dimensioning the power grid. Of course, some of these issues affect, but for us it is about um, power in every point in the grid. And the grid is from the local side up to the transmission side, has a lot of points. And in every point, you have, have to have the right dimension. Uh, so the difference between energy and power, uh, just an example, very fast for ones here that doesn't know that. I hope everyone here does know it. So the energy in a battery, for example, 23 kilowatt hours. If you have slow charging, it takes seven hours and the power is 3.7. But if you have fast charging, for example, 50 kilowatt, then it takes 30 minutes. So the power, that is what we have to dimension the grid for. Uh, and dimensioning the grid, uh, you have to understand also that in every point of the grid, we want to manage uh, one um, um, uh, feel, one, not wrong, one, uh, not mistake, one, uh, what do you call it? It feel in at it? Anyone? One, one error, okay. With the biggest error, we have to uh, work with that in every grid. And why? Because we want to have um, energy of supply. So we don't have to have uh, customers don't get their electricity. Uh, and this is the challenge when we are, are planning. And also we are planning for a very long time. And what's happening today, no one talked about that 15 years ago or even 50 years ago. So building grid takes a long time and the higher up you are in the grid, the longer time it takes. So for the transmission grid, it can take up to 15 years. In the regional grid, it can take seven to 10 years. And in the, uh, on the low grid, it can take one to two years, but sometimes actually it can take up to seven years, even very down in the grid, but mostly because you have um, problems then on the regional grid. So, and also what's new in, in, in the planning in Sweden is that before we had the same kind of flows in the grid. Uh, now a lot of flows are changing because production and consumption is changing, but also you have more export import from other countries because you have more uh, cables to other countries. And the, the grid was actually dimensioned for having water power in the north 
and consumption in the south. This is how the Swedish grid has been dimensioned on the transmission side. And when this is changing, when you get flows from Finland to Norway and UK, so you get you get the uh, flow from uh, east to west, this is not, the grid was not dimensioned for that. And even flows going from south to north is not dimensioned for. And this actually could be a reality in the future. Uh, so when we look at, at this dimensioning hour, I think there are very few hours that are dimensioning. <laughs> so here you, for example, see what's happening when you have the lowest level in the grid, and here when you have the mid-average, and here the highest level. This is one regional grid in Sweden. And also, so between seasons, it differs a lot. Um, so to understand what we're dimensioning for is actually something that happens very seldom. We talk about a 10-year winter. Uh, and just also to show a little bit about, this is a three-year um, power in, in uh, Uppsala um, region. And here you see that very few hours you have this highest level during these three years. And here's actually a regional grid in the north of Sweden, not far from here, <laughs> not far from Sundsvall. And uh, here you see that this is a different grid because here you have consumption and here you have production. So in the regional grid, sometimes you have more production, only production, and not uh, consumption. But even here you have some hours that are dimensioning on, on both sides. And the biggest challenge is that we have the elification with these very, very big new consumers. So for example, a battery fabric, 300 megawatt. I mean, all the politicians said everywhere, oh, come to us, come to us. Yeah, we build the Uppsala between an Ups bet <laughs> next to Uppsala because 300 megawatt is as much power as you need for the whole Uppsala. So building, just putting a battery fabric or a big data center somewhere uh, that is actually as huge as the city itself, that is not easy. That's not something you do in one, two, three or five years. And also, you have smaller data centers that can be around 50 megawatts, 20 megawatts sometimes, or five bigger uh, fast charging stations. We have perhaps 10 fast chargers. They can be f uh, 50 megawatts. And this is a smaller city like Enköping. And if you want to compare with something else, it's half the capacity of a regional grid, 70 kilowatts. So 70 uh, kilovolts. So I mean, these are huge sizes, and I think that um, understanding this has been a little bit hard for, for the society. Um, so if I then go from the grid, I'll go to the uh, transmission grid. And the transmission, uh, the TSO, they have four main challenges. They have the power balance nationally that I talked about before. And this is actually not a big issue in Sweden even if it's now has been discussed a little bit. I think you've heard about that we could have 150 hours in Sweden. We will not have the power balance. And I would say this is 150 hours that probably will not happen. <laughs> but if they happen, we will know about them the day before. And we have a lot of means to work with it. We, can, we have resources to work with it. But still, it's a new situation because if you go back, we did have five or ten hours calculated, not 150 hours. And also, if we would ha have a problem with the power balance nationally, the consumer would know about it in advance, and they would get uh, curtailed for one, two hours. Th it would not be like if you have a, a, a big uh, storm and then you would have no electricity for a day or a week or something. It would be like more organized. But this is what you read about in the papers, <laughs> discussed a lot. And then you have the frequency. I think Victor will come to that. He's working with uh, services for the frequency. And you have the system uh, responsibility. And there are a lot of things in that. And then you also have the capacity in the grid. And I must say, power is complex. So these, of course, um <laughs> they have you know things going together. Just some years ago, three years ago, we would say, like, we have the problem with capacity in Stockholm, Uppsala, Westeros, Malmö. Some perhaps becoming problems in other regions. And here in the north, it's green. But unfortunately, we have to move the green one <laughs> to the first level. <laughs> so now we actually have the biggest challenges in Sweden here in the north. 
I don't know if you have read about it, but we have so many big actors wanting to be here in the north that actually now this is the high, the <laughs> this is the region, I work a little bit with this region, where we have to work with capacity solutions. And flexibility that I work with is one, uh, one of the tools that we are going to use to try to be able to connect more customers faster. So what is flexibility? And it's called, it has a lot of names. They also call demand response. And I think we use the names differently. But now uh, on the EU level, when we talk about demand response, we don't, we talk about everything, production, consumers that are changing their behaviors because you have a signal uh, from the, for example, TSO or DSO. But uh, it, it can be also energy storage, of course. Uh, before, demand response was more limited, but now we use it in a broader sense. So someone is changing their behavior. It can be a price signal, but can also be like you are purchasing. And this is something new. Purchasing capacity is not something we've been doing a lot in the past, uh, and not on a DSO level, but this is something that I work with. And then you also have something called conditioned uh, connection agreements. This is also a tool in a toolbox that we will need to, to work with. And the rules of these uh, is worked at on the EU level and on the national level as talking. So they are not finished, so the rules are not really there yet. This is actually a problem for us a little bit. Choosing you know, solutions without knowing how will the regulation be. So what happens when you're purchasing? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you have someone who says, I have something to sell. For example, I can be flexible in my, uh, in my consumption as an industry or when I charge my cars. And you sell this to a marketplace for flexibility. And the grid owner on their side, they work with knowing when they need this flexibility. It can be the TSO and it can be the DSOs, and then they purchase it. Uh, and we had demonstrations in Sweden, uh, several of them now, but the first one was actually the demonstration of Coordinate. It was in Uppsala, Gotland, north of Sweden, also in, in uh, Malmö and Skåne, where we actually worked with the first local flexibility markets for capacity in Sweden. And on these markets, you sold to the DSO, but you could also sell to the TSO. You could sell frequency services uh, and salary services to the TSO. So what kind of flex could there be? Uh, and actually, there's a lot of different types of flex. Aggregated heating pumps, uh, heating pumps in industries that are bigger, bigger heating pumps in energy um, companies. Uh, you have a lot of reserve power. Uh, water power can also, hydropower can also be uh, flex. Gas turbines, uh, CHPs, aggregated uh, chargers, for example, um, lights in, in um, uh, vex to uh, <laughs> greenhouses, energy storages and energy communities. But also in the future we see uh, other types of possible uh, flex resources, for example vehicle to grid, data containers, um, hydrogen and so on. But I think the most exciting game changer is the digitalized aggregator and this actors actually been working in these flexibility markets. For example, Ingenic and Tiber, aggregating chargers, aggregating heating pumps, aggregating cooling, um, and they actually sell this aggregated to us, to different markets. So they work with uh, value stacking. So for example, they have some kind of benefits for the owner. That can be temperature, control, for example. It can be working against the subscription, optimizing the subscription uh, for, for the company. But then you can also then sell it to the local markets. You can sell it to the wholesale markets, but also to the balancing markets, MFRR, FCR, and so on. And this is actually an opportunity, but it demands a lot of coordination between the markets. It demands that you have, it's, it should be simple to participate on these, these three markets. It shouldn't be pre-qualification that differs because then it will be a lot of work. And um, this is something we are working with the rules uh, on the national level and on the 
EU level uh, to have rules that could be used. So at the moment, for example, we're working with communication uh, when you are calling for flexibility to have a branch standard for that uh, in Sweden. So that, for example, if an aggregator wants to be in both Sundsvall and Luleå and Malmö, doesn't have to have different kind of APIs for different uh, DSOs. Uh, and actually, if you go back in time, what did the DSO do when we had flexibility? We used the telephone. Go just four years back. <laughs> the only way for a DSO to purchase, to call for flexibility, was using the telephone. This will not work. I mean, we are actually supposed to, for example, document everything we are calling for. Uh, to do that manually is very hard. And if you have a lot of resources, like in Uppsala, we have like... 500 households and um, 10 buildings and uh, two uh, industries and one energy company. I mean, calling them all from the, <laughs> from the operator doesn't work. So you have to work with the digitalization. Um, and this is uh, something that... <laughs> there's a lot of feelings about this. S some people say, oh, but... I mean, can, can someone having a charger have an uh, API? Don't we ask too much? <laughs> and it's a learning process, you know? And I say, for example, it's not ICA and CONSUM who will have the API. It will be the, 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 the one having the, 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 the charger or the one having the service of, of paying. Someone will be the one who will have this on a national level, selling this service to the customers. But it's, 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 it's a change movement in your head, understanding these kind of things. Uh, and also as a DSO, it's hard. I mean, oh, don't we ha shouldn't we steer the consumer? I mean, having a business model telling them that we are calling for them doesn't feel safe. Can we really trust it? So it's really change management on all level. Uh, so this is what is needed. And if you go then back, so this is a new role for the for the grid operators. Like if you go back, we worked as a distribution network operator. And we build and operated and um, um, uh, renewed uh, uh, grids. And now we have to work as a system operator with a lot of more tools, like the smart uh, digitalized uh, DSO. So I would say coping with the challenges in the energy system, we have to get here to the system operator. We are called system operators, but we are not system operators yet. We are doing this in, in demonstrations, large-scale demonstrations that we are continuing with, but we're not yet doing it uh, whole scale. In Sweden, we are good in metering. We are, like in the European Union, one of the best countries coming to, to how far we have come in metering. But in, in regard of working as a system operators, we are still new beginners. But this is going to be an exciting journey into the future meeting those challenges in the energy system. So that was a little bit um, introduction. Here we have the content information also if you for later on. So I am uh, Kent Bertelsson. Uh, professor here in power electronics at Minsk Wind University. I will mainly discuss some of the problems that will occur in the grid and then uh, Victor here, uh, industrial PhD student, will uh, go into details about, uh, about how that, that is implemented. Uh, as uh, Yvonne said, we are going from an earlier implementation of the grid where we have uh, static centralized generation, big power plants distributing the power to the customer down in the grid. Uh, we are moving to a more decentralized generation. We have smaller power plants distributed within the grid. Uh, and also that will uh, uh, reverse the power flow. Before the power always went from the generation source to the down to load. Sometimes now it will go in the opposite directions and so on. Uh, and uh, as uh, Yvonne also mentioned here, we need to measure 
lot we need to control things dynamically in a completely different way than uh, was needed in the earlier grid. Uh, we the energy storage will be a very important thing in order to handle the demand and response so that we can balance out the difference between generation and uh, and the consumption. So one example that will occur in the normal system where we have always the the Uh, where we have the always the it was designed for closer to transformer further out on the line the the voltage is is dropping because the power direction is going from the transformer and out to the grid uh, but nowadays lots of customers they would like to uh, place uh, uh, s s solar power far out in the grid uh, a problem will be when it is a sunny day in the summer, low consumption, the power flow that is reversed. And uh, that means that if you norm before you had the, it was designed for this operation, the voltage rise instead on the on the power line. And of course then the neighbors here, they will be very angry because the television sets is damaged and so on. Uh, so you need to do some modification there. What you could do dynamically or static is you could uh, change this transformer with the tap changer and so on. Either you can use it manually or there is can be done uh, dynamically also in slow variations. Uh, you don't have that remote on that many places far out in the grid. Uh, the problem is also that if you have a big solar installation and you have a cloud passing, this uh, situation is changed in a few seconds. So you need to have uh, equipment that can handle these kind of things dynamically. And uh, instead of going from larger and bulky uh, <laughs> dumb transformers, you can go to more intelligent solid state transformers. So this is more or less a power converter instead but then you can uh, dynamically control the turn ratio in from from pulse to pulse. Uh, another interesting, uh, more closer and perhaps more robust design is also uh, this was called an LVR line voltage regulator. Uh, what that can do, you then you have a small series transformer in the power grid. Uh, this uh, series transformer can add or reduce uh, delta T or delta dV or delta voltage. Uh, so, and uh, you're taking power from the grid, you're feeding it to the, the series transformer, and then you can add or reduce the voltage. So then that you can handle dynamically in a way, and uh, this can re react much quicker. And it's also uh, closer to an uh, iron nail solution, so it's uh, more robust as one. Uh, another thing that uh, occurs in the, the power grid is when you're having large, uh, large plant is suddenly removed from the, from the grid. Uh, then uh, this will react in the, in the, in the grid that, uh, that the frequency will drop, because the frequency is typically held by large turbine, large rotating objects in the in the grid, uh, and the inertia of, of these ones. And if you have a sudden change in the production and reaction, it will respond in the frequency. Uh, and this frequency, if if you detect such frequency uh, difference, you try to mitigate that by short by fast increasing the uh, the produ produced power into the grid. This is typically done in all earlier days with the water power plants. Uh, and uh, if you detect these water power plants to increase the production, uh, the water power plants, uh, they need a few seconds to, to react. And uh, 
before this to to take this fast derivative and to get more power in the Svenska Kraftnät have in the recent days starting to uh, to uh, uphandle the this fast frequency reserve so that you introduce power much quicker into the power grid when you detect this uh, frequency variations. And uh, this is what uh, Victor should uh, will discuss. And uh, what we do compared to typically you in you using battery battery installations for and to uh, generate lots of power. Uh, supercapacitor. We have done some research at the university, uh, and uh, when you only need the energy for the first five to ten seconds before the water power plant can start to inject power. Uh, it is much more cost efficiently if you can use supercapacitor instead. Uh, so that is what uh, what Victor will tell you more about. Okay, so now I'll try to tell you more about this thing called frequency regulation. So I'm going to present the project Fast Frequency Reserve from Hydropower. My name is Victor Darlan. It's a joint research project between Soleftio Kommun and they own a power plant called Soleftio Forsen. That's where I work and I'm conducting research here at Mid Sweden University. So I'm going to talk about what is frequency regulation, zooming down a bit from the broader grid perspective that Yvonne presented and, and Ken presented. Uh, setting the context of hydropower and frequency regulation historically and today. What are supercapacitors? Why do we want to use them as the energy storage? And then draw some broad strokes on the scope of the research project and present some preliminary results and try to keep within the time so we have time for questions. So I'll jump right into what is frequency regulation. We were talking about frequency dips, how to mitigate them. The frequency is to be kept exactly at 50 hertz. And how do we do that? We do that by keeping production and consumption exactly the same in every second. Um, but I've drawn out some frequency data here from uh, a few days this summer, end of June, beginning of the ju July. And what we can see is that the frequency is never exactly at 50 hertz. It always deviates a bit. So the TSO, or the transmission system operator, Svenska Kraftnät, they uh, have some tools to mitigate these frequency dips. And they're called uh, frequency containment reserves, for example. And they are resources that either increase the production or decrease the consumption or decrease the production or increase the consumption to mitigate these kind of frequency deviations. So if there is a surplus of electricity in the power system, the frequency goes up. And if there is a shortage, the frequency goes down. And the containment reserves try to counteract this deviation in frequency. So these reserves always sense what is the frequency and how should we act. And the frequency uh, FCRN is one of these resources and it acts within this shaded area. So if the frequency goes, yeah, is within these uh, limits, the frequency FCRN automatically activates. Um, and then we have some other frequency uh, containment reserves that are reserved for if there is a pretty serious frequency deviation. It's called D for disturbance. So if the frequency goes above 50.1 or below 49.9, the FCRD uh, should be activated. And we're talking about what's happening in the power system. We're getting more uh, converter-based generation, less generator-based uh, production. And... Uh, I've illustrated kind of how this affects the change in frequency in this pedagogical scale that I've drawn here with uh, two different bases where you can say that uh, a power system with lots of generators producing electricity has kind of a wide base. So if there is a dip in production, it, the scale won't tip as fast. But if we have a, a power system with lots of converter based generation, this base kind of shortens and the, and the system needs to be balanced more actively and faster to counteract dips in frequency. And that's why we introduced, or Svenska Kraftnät introduced, uh, FFR, which is the fastest uh, balancing service. Then we also have slower reserves, uh, AFRR and MFRR, which I'll 
talk a little bit more about later. Um, I talked about the uh, name of the research project is Fast Frequency Reserve from Hydropower. So we're going to kind of focus on this FFR and also the FCRD. So historically, Hydropower has contributed to the bulk of the regulatory power needed. Um, but with the changes in the power system, the uh, frequency containment reserves need to be activated faster. And the FFR is too fast for these old hydropower plants to contribute to. So they can't really access the fastest regulatory service uh, anymore. Um, and here you can see what happens if there is a dip in frequency. All these different uh, regulatory power resources are activated at different times. First, the FCRN kicks in, and then the FF. If there is a pretty, s if it's a pretty serious uh, frequency deviation, the FFR kicks in fast. Then FCRD. And these resources are, resources are usually not that endurant, so uh, the AFRR and MFRR kicks in to restore the frequency back to 50 hertz. You might wonder what's this geometrical shape with blue. It's my illustration of my workspace, the Soleftio Forsen. I'm actually pretty satisfied with the illustration. Um, uh, so the basic outline of the project is then we have this power plant, uh, which is a pretty old Kaplan turbine based power plant. It doesn't have the uh, response time needed to, to act on these fastest system services. And we want to add energy storage and power electronics so that it can inject power almost instantly to the power grid. Um, what are the benefits? So you get a fast response time. You then get access to more regulatory power services, these three here. Uh, and uh, if you combine energy storage with the hydropower plant, it's cheaper than a standalone energy storage system. And you also cause less wear and tear on the hydropower turbines. And you might ask yourself, is this really new? I've seen lots of installations of battery power uh, in uh, coordination with hydropower plants, and that's correct. Uh, a lot of actors have actually done these kind of installations, but they've used batteries instead of supercapacitors. And uh, batteries are the go-to technology when it comes to energy storage. However, we kind of see the hydropower as the large battery in this situation. It acts as the energy reservoir. So we just want to scale the uh, energy storage after the power needed uh, to provide this difference between uh, what's needed to qualify the power plant for the fast system services. Um, and then supercapacitors are a viable option since they have a very high uh, capability of discharging current. So batteries have are great at storing large amounts of energy, but supercapacitors have very high specific power. You don't need that many supercapacitors to, to get uh, very large currents. So you can kind of slim the energy storage if you, if you like. So we want to dimension the energy storage uh, storage after the short durational FFR. This is the shortest and the fastest of all the regulatory power resources available to the TSO. It just is active at nominal power for five seconds. And then we want to investigate what if we coordinate this very slimmed down energy storage with the hydropower plant to also qualify the system for FCRD, which were some of the other system services. Um, and the system dimensions we're looking at is a 5 megawatt uh, nominal power output uh, for uh, 8 seconds. Because if you look at this FFR uh, resource, you have a ramp up time of 1 second, 5 seconds active nominal power, and then ramp down of 5 seconds. So with some basic geometry, that you give, get 5 megawatt for 8 seconds. Um, we also want to look at how do we integrate the supercapacitors in the multi-level, in the, in the converter, um, in a suitable way. So it's a kind of uh, development uh, project as well. Um, so I'd just like to present some preliminary results. In this left graph here, I've plotted what's the requirements to provide FCRD. It's this blue line here. And uh, what are some Kaplan turbine responses? How do they, how fast do they react? Um, and I have one fast Kaplan turbine and one slower Kaplan turbine. And then I've taken the difference between the blue and the red and the blue and the yellow uh, and plotted this in the right hand graph. So this 
is the energy, the, I the integral of, of these graphs are the energy needed to, for the system to provide FCRD. Um, and this blue graph is the FFR requirement. So if you compare the energy needed, um, you can see that if we dimension the system for FFR, this should also be able to, to provide FCRD in coordination with the hydropower plant. So that's good. Um, and uh, uh, we want to investigate this further. And uh, I talked a little bit about converter design. So one of the points of the research project is to uh, develop a converter for this uh, application. And we've been looking at multi-level converters, which normally handles very large voltages, and the use cases are normally HVDC. Um, but in this medium voltage case we have, we have 5 megawatts, we want to supply it to a 10 kilovolt uh, connection point. Um, we see that there is a possibility to increase the number of sub-modules and use low voltage components. Because the uh, smart thing with the multi-level converter is that you can split up the voltage in one of these phase arms so that the semiconductor components in each sub-module only needs to handle part of the total voltage. And here we want to integrate the supercapacitors in parallel or in series and which uh, configuration is uh, part of our research project. And we've done a MATLAB model of this whole converter with the integrated energy storage um, to see if it works and we get some satisfying results. Uh, we're pretty interested in the junction temperature in the semiconductor as we're using vol low voltage rated components. And we see that uh, we do meet the temperature requirements uh, for uh, many of the cases. And I've highlighted some of the best uh, simulation results here in this graph. I'm not going to go into uh, why we chose this overdimensioning, is to make the uh, system resilient over uh, a long time. Um, and uh, I will conclude by saying that um, all of this is the number of, of supercapacitor modules needed to supply this energy. And uh, we have uh, between 50 to 68 sub-modules in the multi-level converter. Um, and this is a project size that would fit in one 40-foot container, so it's possible to do this quite uh, dense, you might say. And the cost is ranging between uh, 400, uh, a bit above $400,000 to a bit over $800,000, depending on which te technologies you choose. And this is also quite competitive uh, compared to battery systems. If you this system would be able to supply FFR and FCRD, it's a pretty satisfying uh, result. So with that, <laughs> I'd like to conclude. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much, all three of you. We have got some questions here from menti.com and you can still send in your questions if you have any more. Um, I think this one is for Yvonne. The politicians are hinting at expanding nuclear power in Sweden. Are the grids prepared for that? Uh, I mean, depends on where you put it, like everything. Uh, so in, in of, co of course, production is positive in many places, but you always have to have the grid built for what you're doing. So even for production, you have to have the right dimensioning of the grid. Uh, so it always depends on where you're putting production or consumption to understand if the grid is prepared or not prepared. Thank you. Uh, and there here is also one question. Uh, solar power on uh, villas and buildings and industries are increasing. Uh, will that be a problem? Yes, <laughs> and no. <laughs> Depends on what you're doing. And I, I was a little bit thinking about what you were saying, Kent, because you were talking about possibilities of having, for example, some kind of solution for voltage control now uh, in, in the product, for example, solar power. We have to have the correct business models. This we don't have them today. Because, for example, if you have solar power in a grid, and the grid is, is built for consumption. Uh, 
and uh, now you get a new dimension in criteria. Uh, summertime, when the sun is shining and you have low consumption. Do you want to build the grid extra, it costs money, for one or five or ten dimensioning hours? Uh, and uh, I mean, voltage control is a little bit different. Or do you want to find solutions where we have more smart grids, smart business models, so we don't have to renew grid and make them less effec effective? So I, I mean, this is really an exciting area, and I, I see a lot of things being done in this work that can actually help the grid of the future. I can comment also that that one, and the, this is a uh, thing that is coming from uh, Sundsvall Selnät, that they have an, at uh, Bosveden, I think, they have installed free, at, uh, at the Bostadsrådet have installed three big uh, 500 kilowatt uh, uh, solar installations there. And Sundsvall Selnät is very afraid how to be able to really ensure that they can handle the power quality or the voltage quality so that they don't see over voltage or and under voltage especially under voltage because it's very it's more unpredictable when the sun is uh, is uh, vanishing if you don't know that but uh, if you have a cloud passing and so on if you when you the sun comes back you always have the possibility to ramp up the power easier and so on and the tap changer transformers they are not built for always go up and down in in voltage voltage range so they have uh, purchased one this lvr system and they will place it for uh, uh, in alna to start with and we will start also to investigate that one and if it is a satisfying solution and it's much it's a cost efficient solution compared to making a more intelligent transformer i would say for, for lower power okay and another question here. How does uh, increase energy consumption command works for balancing frequency? How does increased energy consumption command work for balancing frequency? I'm not sure. Uh, I, it's more about, I, I would say, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, that you have more consumption, that it, uh, it will create more problems for uh, frequency. But I would say that we have consumers that act differently. So for example, if you look at um, heating companies, uh, before you, you, would, you would, as a grid planner, you would know how they would act. They would have, uh, uh, but now we don't know anymore more because they optimize different resources and they participate on different markets. And then the consumer in itself actually uh, makes it harder to understand what's happening in the grid. So we need more coordination, we need better rules in how to interact and act, because otherwise th we will have problems with frequency, for example. So I wouldn't say that more consumers, it's not going to be a problem for frequency. It's more consumers acting differently that will be a problem. Yes, and I think we can take one last question. Will these in, uh, applications perform well in more sunny con countries? Will it require more smart grids? Um, I mean, uh, I think uh, you could say that uh, in Australia, for example, they have uh, had a very large, uh, pr I mean, expansion of their solar power, and they've experienced uh, lots of uh, challenges in handling such a power system. Uh, and I heard someone uh, working at the, uh, an Australian DSO, and he compared like the Australian power system to a jet fighter versus uh, uh, another power system which has more uh, uh, stable resources uh, to like a Boeing uh, 747 because uh, you need to be a lot more uh, faster with your balancing and uh, have really uh, good control over the balance of such a system. So if you do have lots of renewables, then you need to be active with your balancing. But yes, these kinds of solutions are definitely uh, part of or necessary to, to uh, have such a power system that, that can function. And then, of course, we also introduce lots of control system w out on the grid. Everybody is reacting on the same frequency signal, so it's important that you don't overbalance so that you're starting to create o oscillations. And so it's, uh, 
it's an interesting challenge that we have in the future. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. <laughs>